Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone out to this Wednesday evening Bible study here at the Rice Station Christian Church. And I hope everyone uh, is encouraged to come out and worship with us in person on, and worship with us online because we're now meeting on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and, and Wednesday night as well. We'll go ahead and dive right into our lesson today. We've been talking about us walking like an Ephesian. Looking in the book of Ephesians, studying section by section, seeing how to strengthen our spiritual walk. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles or on your Bible apps over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And you know, I love the entire book of Ephesians, but this chapter is probably my favorite chapter in the book. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now the Apostle Paul says a lot right there, encouraging us to be humble and gentle and bear with one another. But he also talks about unity. He speaks of unity, and he speaks of unity all throughout this chapter. If there could be one word that sums up this chapter, I think it would be being, be unity. unity. Unity is vital for the church, because without unity, we would just fall apart. And as our Kentucky state seal and as our money says, united we stand, divided we fall. You know, I've heard of churches splitting or separating people leaving churches over things as silly as the color of carpet or the color of pews or the color of paint or the color of ceiling fans that are put up. I mean, most churches in the United States and around the world are surrounded by people who are on their way to hell, who are lost. And we're supposed to be living out the great commission of taking the word of Jesus Christ, the salvation that's only found through and by him to this world. But instead of doing that, some churches, they are fixated on just physical things instead of spiritual things. They're more fixated on the carpet than they are on lost souls. And people, that should never be. This happens when churches allow Satan to get a foothold, when people allow Satan to get a foothold on their, on their leg, on their heart, on their mind, on their life. And churches that divide over things like that, well... They're more worldly minded than they are spiritually minded. We need to be spiritually minded. Again, unity within the church is vital. Now, Paul addressed this with the church at Corinth. So kind of hold Ephesians chapter 4, if you would, and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to read about a division that took place in the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, and we'll read verses 10 through 13. There the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, one says I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another I follow Cephas or Simon Peter, still another I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? Now, so there's this big division going on at the church at Corinth, and they were divided because of who their favorite preacher is. I mean, isn't that so silly? Some said, I follow Paul. Some said, I follow Simon Peter. Some said, I follow uh, Apollos. But that should never be. Because preachers are merely servants of God entrusted with the task of taking His Word to this world, going to congregations, preaching, and, and upbuilding 
uh, the saints and establishing elders and deacons within the church. They are men. We are, we preachers are men. There should never be a division over who your favorite preacher is. Now, remember in the Old Testament, all the people spoke one language, and this is in Genesis chapter 11. So the people decided that they were going to make a great name for themselves and build a big tower up to the heavens. And they were very arrogant. This was called the Tower of Babel. But look what God says in Genesis eleven six. So hold Ephesians 4 and just turn over to Genesis eleven six. And this is an important verse about unity. An important verse. It says, The Lord said... Genesis eleven six. The Lord said, "If as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them." When we're unified, the Lord says we can accomplish great things. Now we know with the Tower of Babel, because of their arrogance and their pride, the Lord confused their language and they couldn't continue to build this tower. You see, unity is a powerful thing. And we as the church can win so many more souls. And we can make such a bigger impact on the world around us when we are unified for the cause of Christ. We must be unified for the cause of Christ. We must keep the spirit of unity in the church. And that's what Paul's talking about there in Ephesians 4. 1 through 3. So let's move on in our text and we'll move to Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. And there the Apostle Paul says there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this is a very powerful section of Scripture. This is a very powerful section of solid doctrine. This talks about us having one Lord. And the one Lord, He is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can save us. Through and by Him only can we go to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through and by me. Simon Peter says that there's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. He is the one Lord. He's the one that died on the cross. He's the one that rose again. He's the one that's reigning at the right hand of the Father. He is the one interceder that we have. He is the one Lord. Also, we read that there is one God. And He is God the Father, and He is over all and in all. He sustains all. He is all-powerful. He is the Heavenly Father. We read there that there is one Spirit. And the one Spirit, He is the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell within us Christians when we're baptized into Christ. He dwells within the Jew and the Greek and all baptized believers. So we see right here the Trinity, the Godhead, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three separate yet one, one God, one Father, one Holy Spirit. Also, Paul says we have one hope, and our hope is in God, and our hope is that we will dwell with God for eternity in that beautiful glory land of heaven where none of the sin or evil or impurities or illnesses of this life are, where we will be surrounded by beauty, where the glory of the Lord will shine the entire holy city of the new Jerusalem. We have hope in God and hope that we will dwell with him in that place forever. We also read that there is one faith. And that faith is that we have faith in God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And faith is so vitally important. Time and time again, throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, he would ask people, where is your faith? We read an entire chapter in Hebrews called the Great Faith Chapter of Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, we're given a definition of faith. So let's, let's look at that if you would. Hold Ephesians 4 and let's read about this one faith that we have. Ephesians, 
Hold Ephesians 4 and go to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. And there the Scriptures say, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's the definition of faith. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Basically, we can't physically see God, but we are absolutely certain that He is there. And we live by that faith, not by sight, as the Apostle Paul says. We can be certain that God is there. Now, an atheist might say, well, just how can you be certain that God is there? Well, let me explain that this way. Take the earthly example of gravity. I mean, we can't see gravity, but we completely believe in gravity. We all do. Why? Well, because gravity holds us to the earth. We can't see it, but we can feel the effects of gravity because it holds us down. Now, the same is true with the Almighty God, only on a much greater level. We can't physically see Him, but we can definitely physically see the works of His Almighty hands. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And look in verse 20. There the Apostle Paul says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And what this basically means is we can look at this world around us that God created the trees, the fish, the animals, the ecosystem, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the fact that it all holds together perfectly. We can look at the human body and how perfectly it, it functions, and we can see God's intelligent des design. Therefore, no one can deny God. And because of that, there is no excuse for not obeying and living for Him. As Paul said in Romans 1, that we are without excuse. We can see His intelligent design. We can see His power all around us. And we may not be able to physically see Him, but we can see the work. So we live by faith and not by sight. So there is one God who our faith and hope is in. Now after this, Paul also says that there is one God body. One body. Now, we live in a world, and I've mentioned this before, we live in a world where people say, well, it doesn't matter where you go to church as long as you go. I've heard people say about their relatives, you know, I, I know they're going to that church and they don't teach right, but at least they're going to church. I mean, so many people say that, that it doesn't matter where you go to church as long as you go. But nothing could be farther from the truth because it does matter where you go to church. Why? Because this world is eaten up with false doctrine. There are false teachers everywhere, like ferocious wolves going around, leading people down that broad way that leads to destruction. And what people need, the church that people need, is the one body, the one body of Christ. The one body is the body of Christ that stands for the truth that is within the Bible, the solid doctrine of the Bible. We need to be able to look in the Word and see what our, our preacher is preaching. We need to be able to look in the Word and see what the teachers are teaching. Otherwise, we may be going down a wrong path. And that's the reason that when I teach, I encourage you to turn with me to different passages because there's so much false doctrine in this world, and I don't want you to take Joe's word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. The one body is the body of Christ, also known as the body of Christians, that stands for the solid doctrine, the church that stands for the solid doctrine. As I said last week, if you're a Christian at the Rice Station Christian Church or if you're a Christian at the Christian Church in Lexington or in Haiti or in Egypt, as long as you're a part of the solid doctrine church, you're a part of the one body, the body of believers, the body of the saved. 
So there's one body. Also, Paul here talks about one baptism. Now, when some people read this, they may say, well, that means I can only be baptized one time, and if I was baptized incorrectly, oh well. But, but that's not what this means at all. This means that there is one correct baptism, and that is to be baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I mean, there are some churches out there that baptize for church membership or they say it's just an outward expression of an inward faith. No, we must be baptized. And there's one correct way to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins into the name of the Lord for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we see that and we have seen that in the past in Acts chapter 19. When Paul made his first trip into Ephesus, he met 12 men who needed to be rebaptized. Why? Because they were not baptized correctly. So they needed to be baptized correctly. So living in these seven truths that there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, living in these seven truths helps unite the one church, Christ church. Now, we'll move on in our text here to Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. Ephesians 4, 7 through 10 says, But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he led the captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all universe in order to fill the whole universe. Okay, these verses are a quotation of Psalm chapter 68 and verse 18. And this is speaking of the fact that Christ came to earth, and that's why it says he descended. He came to earth in the flesh to lead us from the captivity of our sins. And then when he had completed that mission in Acts chapter 1, he ascended back to the Father where he's reigning at the right hand of the Father. So that's what this is talking about here. Paul is reminding us that we serve the one God who sent a part of himself to this earth to die on the cross, to raise again, to ascend, and he did everything that he did to save us. Moving on in our text again, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined uh, the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, and each part does its work. So this is reminding us, the first couple verses especially, are reminding us that God has established certain positions in His church. He has established the office of apostle in the office of prophet. Now, the office of apostle, of course, we know no one is an apostle today because one of the qualifications of an apostle was that they had to walk on the earth with Jesus Christ and spend time physically with him. And we know that after the apostles died, then there were no more apostles. We know there are no more prophets today because 1 Corinthians 13 tell us that prophecies came to cease. There's only one event that is prophesied about, and that is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, we also see that uh, we have evangelists, also known as preachers or ministers. And the job of the evangelist is to preach and teach the Word, to basically be a spiritual leader for the church. 
pastors. Now, that's, that's a big one because so many people in this world today will call their preacher pastor. But that's actually not using that word right. Pastors are also known as elders or bishops in the church, and their job is to oversee the entire flock, oversee all the business of the church, even to oversee the evangelist. Also, we have deacons, and deacons are servant leaders who work hand-in-hand hand with the minister and with the elders of the church. And this section of Scripture also talks about how some are teachers, and we need teachers to teach the Word of God in Sunday school classes, to teach the Word of God through our lives and the way we live our lives. These are God-established positions, and all these positions are to work together in unity to grow the church church to help the church stay unified in the absolute solid doctrine now of course we are all under christ who is the head of the church christ is the head of the church and we followers of christ are the body some of us are the arms of the body some of us are the legs of the body we're doing different tasks but christ is the head of the church now also we see in verse 16 that we are encouraged that all parts of the body are to work together. You know, in the church, it should never be that 10% of the people do 90% of the work. No, in the church, we need everyone to use their skills and abilities and talents to further the cause of Christ. I've no, I've, I've heard people before say, oh, well, that's the, the preacher's job to live out the Great Commission, or that's this person's job, or that person's job, so I'm not going to do it. That's a horrible attitude. We need to have the attitude that I'm going to do my part. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to live out the Great Commission. I'm going to pull as much weight as I can to further the Lord's church because the church is his divine institution that he's established on this earth to take his word to the world and i'm a part of that church we need to have a good attitude like that so let's go farther in our text to verses 17 through 24 so verse 17 says ephesians 4 17 it says so i tell you this and insist on it in the lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkness in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed." That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him according with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which, has, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So right here, Paul is saying, listen, you don't live the way you did in the past anymore. You don't live according to the worldly nature. You don't live according to the sinful nature. Instead, you live by the Holy Spirit of God. You stay in step with the Spirit. You walk with the Holy Spirit. Whenever the devil tries to put those thoughts of going back to a way of life that you did before in your mind, you put them out and you live the new life that is in Christ Jesus, that new life that you began to live when you were baptized into Christ. You stay on that path. You don't turn back to your old sinful ways because when you do, it's like a dog turning back to its vomit. So you stay on that narrow way that leads to life, living with that new attitude, that good attitude, that Christian attitude. Let's go forward here, and we will go to verses 25 through 32. And what I like to call this section here is uh, practical Christian living. So we'll take this kind of section by section here. It says in verse 25, verse 25 through 32, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. He's encouraging that unity again. Speak the truth. Be people of truth. Preach the truth. You are part of the one body. And then verse 26 starts talking about something that we deal with. 
And it says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Okay, so we get angry in this life, right? I mean, sin makes us angry. And there's nothing wrong with being angry. Jesus Christ himself, he got angry, didn't he? I mean, remember when they were buying, selling, and trading in the temple? And Jesus said, it's supposed to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. And he overturns the table of the money changers and gets a whip and chases all the cattle and everything out. Jesus was angry because of sinfulness. Sin should make us angry. But it says here, we are not to let our anger result in sin. And that our sin is, or excuse me, that our anger is to be short-lived and quickly resolved. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Let it be short-lived and quickly resolved. And then the next verse really just goes right along with that. And it says, and do not give the devil a foothold. If we stay angry, that anger, anger turns into a grudge. That grudge turns into hatred. And what, what we've done is we have given Satan a foothold by allowing our anger to turn into sin. So we got to be careful with that. Verse 28 says, And anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they must have something to share with those in need. So we are told to be hard-working Christians. We are not made to just sit around and be lazy. We are made to be productive servants in the kingdom, to make a difference in this world around us by reaching out to those in need. And the biggest need is that everyone needs Jesus Christ. Verse 29, and this is a big one here. This is a big one here. Like I said, this is practical Christian living. So he's really giving us a course in Christianity 101. Verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, Christians. It will damage our witness, which means don't be going around gossiping about somebody. Don't be going around saying negative things about people, things that will tear people down. It says to say things that build people up. We don't need to go around using foul words because that's a damage to our witness. We don't need to go around saying mean things about people. We need to watch our mouths because we can cause people not to come to Christ if we use our mouths, our words, our tongues in bad ways. And I encourage you, in your own personal Bible study, look what in all the book of James says about the improper use of the tongue. But only say that which will build up other people. And verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed from the day of redemption. We know the Holy Spirit, He comes to dwell within us when we're baptized into Christ. And if we turn from our way of of the narrow way that leads to life and we turn back to the ways of sin we are grieving the holy spirit the holy spirit will then convict us we need to stay on that narrow way that leads to life and then verse 31 says get rid of all bitterness rage anger brawling slander again slander talking about using the tongue improperly along with every form of malice And then it says, be kind and compassionate to one another. We need to be compassionate people. We need to be kind to people. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, he was always kind and compassionate to people. And he says, forgive each other. We know that if we don't forgive others, that the Heavenly Father will not forgive us. Jesus tells us that in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus hanging on the cross, suffering for the sins of the world, said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they were doing. Jesus was always forgiving people, always being kind, always being compassionate. May the people see Jesus in us. Be kind and compassionate to each other. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Now that's a wonderful chapter here. And if we really take all these principles, if we live in unity, if we take the principles of practical Christian living, if we take the message here and apply it to our spiritual walk, then we will walk walk like an Ephesian. We will walk like the Christians that we need to be.
Now, maybe there's someone listening to this broadcast this evening and they're living a life outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, I want you to know that today you can make a change. Today you can live the new life in Christ Jesus. Today you can serve the Lord. Today you can be forgiven. Today you can have heaven ahead. If you live out God's plan of salvation, the plans to hear the word of God, to believe the word, to repent of your sins, to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You must be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you must live faithfully for the Lord all the way to the end. And I tell you what, lost soul, you never know when your life's going to be over. You never know when Christ Jesus is going to return. The Bible says no one knows the day, no one knows the hour. We need to be ready, and we're ready by obeying and living for Jesus Christ. And once we rise from that watery grave of baptism, we are a part of that one body, that body of Christians. So if you need to make a decision to obey the Lord for the first time, to rededicate your life, or if you want us to pray with you, give us a call here at the Rice Station Christian Church. My cell phone number is 606 205 0549. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the solid doctrine. And Father, may we stand on that doctrine. May you convict our hearts, Lord, to take your word to this world and be your church that makes a difference in the world around us. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and that we serve the risen living Lord. Father, I pray for those who have had surgery today, those who have lost loved ones. I pray that you comfort them. Those who are on the prayer list, I pray that you heal them. And we trust in you, Father, and we know that you have the ability to do this, to heal all the sick, to heal this land, Father. Lord God, thank you for loving us so bountifully that you sent Jesus. And it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray, and amen.